Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for our fireside chat today, uh, hosted by Health Monics with our friends over at MD Portals. Today, we are going to be discussing how to improve your HCC scoring. Our panelists for today are going to be Health Monics CEO, Lauren Patrick, and MD Portals, Jeff Larich. So there will be questions um, on the panel on the right-hand side. You'll be able to ask questions, and if we have time at the end, we will get to them. Otherwise, we will answer your questions after the webinar uh, sometime uh, by the end of this week, early next week. Uh, we also have some handouts down the bottom. There's a few presentation slides that I don't have on there, but I will be emailing them afterwards but there are some uh, case studies as well as some information on our products that are located in the handout section. So without further ado, I'm gonna throw this over to Jeff and uh, he's gonna walk us through a little bit about what is HCC scoring and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. So HCC scoring is really used uh, primarily for Medicare Advantage plans and other similar plans, but uh, in recent years, it was also used to uh, uh, track and pay for the Obamacare plans uh, with the insurance companies. The HCC uh, categories are disease groups broadly organized into body systems, and each of these uh, disease groups are clinically related in terms of cost to the Medicare program. The risk factor scoring is an algorithm they use to assess the health risk and acuity using a numerical relational scale. And each payer may develop a different methodology, but we'll be uh, primarily discussing the Medicare HCC uh, methodology. The final scoring calculation is accumulation of all the ICD-10s and HCCs on uh, assessing the patient risk and at future reimbursement for those patients in the uh, Medicare Advantage plans. Yes. I was on mute. In the meantime here, I'm gonna throw up a, a poll for our users to uh, answer if you don't mind real quick. I'm taking time and answering this poll question. Uh, what is your current understanding of HCC scoring? All right, thank you very much. It looks like most everybody here is at least familiar or uh, has limited experience with HCC scoring. However, there's one expert on the line and I think I made the joke before. Uh, anytime you want a job, come give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so on to the next slide as we go along. Thank you very much. So the HCCs are used uh, primarily to assess patient risk and acuity, uh, and they have to be resubmitted and, and you know processed every year uh, by the plans. And they, and we're switching over to a system uh, where they're going to be using uh, by 2022 uh, a fully uh, encounter database, and uh, instead of the old 2017 system, right now we're in a transition. Uh, this year, it's 50-50 of the methodologies. Next year, it'll be 75-25. And by 2022, it'll be um, basically 100% encounter-based data. Uh, the HCCs are really pull in. Uh, you have both prospective and uh, retrospective methodologies that are used by a lot of the health plans and providers. It pulls from all diagnostic sources, and it really is an attempt to uh, document uh, multiple chronic diseases and the disease interactions. And it also pulls in, uh, obviously, the demographics of the patients and their eligibility for dual eligibility, et cetera. As many of you know, uh, we're 
rapidly moving towards more value-based payment uh, methodologies. And I think with the COVID virus, we are actually probably going to be accelerating uh, that movement. Uh, most payers have or will implement payments based on patient acuity, uh, what we call the BUCA. The big five insurance companies are all doing it to varying degrees. Many of them have their own Medicare Advantage plans as well, and they uh, basically port that over to their commercial plans in varying degrees around the country. The contract fee schedules are becoming more and more correlated to the level of patient acuity. And many plans are offering shared savings or other incentive payments to reduce medical costs while improving quality. But the shared savings ACOs and MSSP and other uh, value-based contracts are, must be suited to the practice. And MACRA MIPS uh, may have the most to offer specialty-only practices versus the uh, health plans, which are attributed to the primary care doctors. Uh, basically, you need to accumulate uh, and seek arrangements based on cost to manage the procedures uh, and for the specialists such as joint replacements or cardiac procedures or cares. The uh, HCC though has to be accumulation of all the care from all providers and, and I always recommend uh, trying to get the data from the other providers with the diagnosis and HCC codes and then you can accumulate it. How do payers measure cost? A uh, good example on the left is a $12,000 patient uh, risk adjustment factor, 1.13 cost to patient of uh, 9,000. That's a high performer on the matrix. A bad example is 5,000 patients on the RAF with a 0.92 and the cost per patient of 13,000. Uh, you're going to see more and more of the insurance carriers as well as Medicare starting to really uh, assess the cost per patient and, and attribute it to back to the you know, primary care providers as well as the specialists. So the next one, we're gonna go over to, push it over to Lauren and discuss why, why is Health Monics getting involved in this? Well, there is a big impact when it comes to MIPS. So Lauren, if you wanna share, what is the impact of HCC scoring with MIPS? Sure, be happy to. So. Um, first, I want to I want to comment that so what Jeff was talking about certainly is applicable. It started off. Oh dear, all of my devices are starting to ring all of a sudden. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a big impact on the um, MIP side uh, from the HCC scoring that actually Jeff was just talking about. While it started off in the Medicare DMA world, it's infiltrated, as he said, a lot of the private payers. And um, it's actually entering in the world of ACOs and uh, MIPS as well. Um, in particular, when we look at cost, the cost component of MIPS, which will be 30% by 2022, um, all of those calculations are heavily, heavily influenced by HCC scores. And so that's kind of where we got involved because we work with so many providers in that MIPS and ACO world. We wanted to make sure that we were doing our best to educate and to help folks um, do better in that world. So um, hence we partnered up with, with Jeff and MD Portals and their group to really be able to offer additional understanding and tools in that arena. And when you look at the cost component, it'll, it'll sway your score um, enormously. If, if you do well on um, HCC and risk adjustment scoring, um, be you a primary care doc or be you a specialist, a hospitalist, it really is touching everyone that's involved in the MIPS world. In addition, there's a what we call a complex patient bonus, and that's been around for a while. And initially, I think it was part of the quality component where um, you could get an extra five points added to your quality score. Well, now what CMS has done is they pulled it out of that um, component category um, as of last year, 2019, and they made it its own additional bonus on top of all the other uh, categories and um, made it up to an extra five points that you could get. And it is totally based on your HCC scoring and your dual eligibility of um, Medicare and Medicaid. So um, super important if you're interested in those uh, points. Um, the average provider will get the average score, which is two and a half um, 
points. Um, but I just want to point out that while this says up to an extra five points, and that's been true, um, in the proposed rule that just came out on August 3rd, 4th, um, CMS has proposed and is strongly advocating moving that up to 10 extra points for 2020, for this year. So even though it's the 2021 proposed rule, they're saying for this year, you can get an extra 10 points um, for treating complex patients because of all of the extra effort and um, changes that are happening in terms of being um, needing to um, support uh, COVID patients. Um, so that's my spiel. <laughs> so when we talked about the cost performance here uh, as well, Lauren, if you don't mind going over, uh, just showing this slide and, and the ability for people uh, to understand what that impact is for their cost score. And if you guys have questions on the proposed rule, we did just put out a webinar earlier this week on the proposed rule. If you visit our site, uh, healthmonics.com, there's a section for webinars that you could check out the proposed rule on. Sure, so in terms of cost performance scoring, um, they do have measures just like we have measures in the quality component. And they have deciles just like we have in the quality component. So they'll look at the measures and the measures run everywhere from total per capita cost, which is the total cost of taking care of a patient for a year, if you're more in the primary care arena. But then there's also a Medicare spending per beneficiary, which is a roll up of hospitalizations. And now there are 18 additional episode measures which run the gamut from acute conditions to procedures, from knee arthroscopy to uh, PCI to um, a hospitalization for pneumonia, kidney disease, those sorts of things. So what CMS does is they look at all of your episodes and they risk adjust all of them um, before they assign a score. So um, you can essentially, if you've got a patient that has a risk a HCC score that's that's two or three, you can get two or three times the amount of available spending for those patients to achieve the same decile. So again, super, super important that we look at HCC scoring, that we make sure that we do what we can to um, get credit for our complex patients that we're treating. Great, thank you very much, Lauren. And Jeff, while we're on that topic and we just discussed HCC scoring and how it uh, works with your Medicare patients through MIPS, what, what is the impact for those on Medicare Advantage plans? Well, the impact can be very substantial. Uh, basically for every 0.1 uh, increase in the uh, risk adjustment factor it translates to roughly about $1,000. Uh, that the Medicare Advantage plan will receive uh, for that patient's care for that year. Um, the uh, timeline on that is if you submit uh, the updated scores before uh, June, you'll probably get uh, the reimbursement for the plan uh, by January uh, normally, but it can take up to 12 to 18 months, but it, it, the money does come in and it is substantial if you're uh, fully documenting the uh, multiple disease processes that are embedded in the HCC and, and making sure that the plan gets paid appropriately instead of underpaid. Great, thanks. And, you know, to even further that question along, now that we've talked about Medicare Advantage, um, but what about other commercial payers and even Medicaid? So, so the other big one that uh, has come on recently is all of the uh, base you know, the Affordable Care Act, all the Obamacare plans, the insurance companies are reimbursed by the government based on all the HCC scores as well. And that's uh, factored in uh, and has been for the last several years now. And uh, it's that's sort of what really was the uh, Trojan horse that got them into all the other commercial side of things where people are starting to apply it for that as well. Terrific, thanks, Jeff. Uh, over to you, Lauren. Now. We've discussed all of these plans and, and, and reimbursement. Outside of reimbursement, though, what additional impacts does uh, HCC have? Sure. So HCC is about making sure that you're coding the complexity of your patients and, and sharing that knowledge. And so one of the things that it does is 
once those are coded, as long as they're coded in a place where it's shareable, other providers can learn about the underlying conditions for those patients. So being able to share that across providers um, is a benefit if you're doing it, it um, appropriately. Um, in terms of, of the individual providers, however, just taking a look at patients and understanding that patient's complexity. Um, we've been looking through a lot of claims data from Medicare. And what we see is that so often there are patients that have been diagnosed by a provider um, for a simple underlying condition, and they're receiving no care by their primary care physician this year for those underlying conditions. And then what happens is their conditions become more severe and they end up needing some sort of acute care. So really paying attention to the underlying chronic conditions of your patients by, by going through an exercise of looking through and, and making sure that that patient's whole picture is documented. Um, it allows you to focus more on complex patients. Um, if you're gonna get paid more, reimbursed more for taking care of those complex patients, then perhaps you'll take more time um, looking at them and it allows you to understand the whole patient rather than just the part, um, just whatever that patient has shown up at your doorstep for today or on yes. the phone now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, telemedicine visits too, yes. The uh, bottom line on that is you want to code for all documented conditions which coexist at the time of the visit that requires or affect the patient care or treatment. And that's really, you want to capture any everything that uh, has an impact on that at, at all. So when, when in doubt, document. <laughs> that's great. And that segues into the next question that we have. Um, and I'm going to start with Lauren on this one as well. But what are some of the biggest challenges that everybody from a small practice, even to a large uh, health organization, come to when it comes to HCC? Well, the biggest one is you have to do this documentation every year. So um, while you may have documented last year that this is a diabetic patient, if you don't document it this year, that goes away. And if you don't diagnose, if you don't take the, the minute or two to figure out that you need to, um, to diagnose, you need to document more specifically your patient, then again, that knowledge disappears. So it really has to be a discipline that, that, that folks do. And, um, the other part is, um, and one of the reasons that we partnered with MD Portals is um, that um, the folks that are doing the doing the documentation, be it the, the physician in the room with the patient or be it someone in the back office, um, they don't have the access to the data. They don't have the total picture. And this is just such a huge, huge problem in our, in our world right now. It's interoperability is still a, a problem that we haven't been able to, to solve. And so we don't have access to that data. So that's what MD Portals helps us do is bring that data in. I didn't mean this to be a sales pitch, but um, it's just really, it's the problem that stumps us all. I was just on a, a call with the ONC last week and they were saying that for any project, you know, 50 to 70% of any IT project right now in the healthcare field is figuring out how to get that data. And that trickles down to all of the providers because they don't have the data in order to do the HCC scoring, in order to understand the complexity of the patient that they're that they're working with. Well, the, the other big challenge there is, you know, again, the bane of uh, most doctors' existence. Even if they have, um, you know, basically someone helping them document and code while they're in the office, is the uh, just the amount of work to uh, really take the time to talk to the patient and pull all that data, which a lot of it is disparate data that's not searchable. So you got to read through it. Um, and then, you know, trying to wrestle with some of the uh, EHRs we have out there. I think if you talk to most of the providers that are in their 50s or 60s, they just roll their eyes. Um, you know, the younger doctors and, and whatnot are more used to the computers and all the EHRs versus some of the uh, baby boomer generation. So it's a, a, it's a huge challenge for them. So, so Jeff and Lauren actually is a great question from someone in the yeah. audience. And it does match very similar to something that I uh, ran into yesterday talking with a client. Um, their question is, we report HCC codes as much as possible. 
and, but on their QPP for 2019 and their cost score, they, they, they received a score of in the tens out of 15. What could they be looking at to do to improve that score? 10 out of 15. Well, for their cost score. The cost, the cost score? score? Sure. Did so you yeah, so, yeah, I, I thought both of you kind of throw a little in no, there. We were just talking about well, it, so it was a good timing. Well, again, uh, I would suggest that they're probably not capturing all the uh, ICD-10 codes uh, that they should be capturing for those patients. Um, is probably why their cost uh, score was, you know, knocked down uh, because they aren't justifying, you know, some of the treatments that they're doing with what they're documenting or documenting accurately. So that, that would be where I would start to look at it. The other part of, so the other part of that is cost right now is this black box, right? You get a score of 10 out of 15 and you're going, I'm doing everything that I can do. Um, mm -hmm. We at Healthmonics have started actually pulling Medicare claims more proactively because what we found is that providers are getting attributed with patients or episodes that they don't even know they're getting attributed. Um, That's true. Part B is a little bit different than if you have an ACO patient panel, if you have, a, if you have your Medicare Advantage patients, you know who they are. Um, with Part B, that's not necessarily the case in terms of the way attribution works. And CMS goes out there at the end of the year, for example, for um, total per capita cost, and they look at what, what physician provided the most what they term primary care and it could have been their foot doctor it could have been their dermatologist um, and so you don't know who you're who you're getting attributed to you and who's factoring in or what episodes are factoring in to those scores so um, that's that's the other half of why cost scores are so um, hard to understand and hard to control Great, thank you. I thought that was good timing. Thank you for that question. Um, also, and please ask away if there's other people that have other questions, they're great. So we discussed about what are the biggest challenges, but what are the biggest mistakes that you see, Lauren, that people are making? I think we talked about it a little bit, but if you could go into more detail, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so I think that the first thing is, is just not coding or not coding enough. Um, uh, some EHRs only allow up to what eight uh, codes. Um, I think CMS will take at least 12 codes per claim, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Jeff's more of a wizard at that. Um, so not coding enough, um, and then not picking the the codes that are really uh, specific to that patient. So just checking off that it's a diabetic patient instead of a diabetic patient with perhaps an underlying chronic kidney issue. Right. So Jeff, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, what what I see happening a lot because you know people are trying to be as efficient and and whatnot is they do a lot of what I call copy and pasting from the previous visits uh, into the EHR, which may or may not accurately reflect the current condition of that patient. Uh, sometimes they don't even you know reconfirm some of that, um, and that causes coding errors. Um, I generally expect with you know my providers that they they need to do a really good job of, of documenting and then you know the billing and coding people are the ones that translate that into uh, with the help of the EHR into the appropriate codes. Everything starts with that documentation though and in uh, the templates that they use within their practices depending on the specialty. Great, thanks. And you know, now we talked about the challenges. We talked about some of the uh, biggest mistakes. But what are some of the best practices, Jeff, that you're seeing? Well, I'll go back to the challenges again. The, the whole biggest issue is there's so much disparate data that's not getting back to the, especially the primary care providers. Um, I can tell you that oftentimes in a primary care practice, they won't even know that their patient was in the hospital until they walk in for one of their other visits and might mention that they were hospitalized. Uh, it happens all the time, for example. Best practices are you really need to, a week or two before the patient's appointment, reach out. Uh, if you refer uh, 
care out to the GI doc or the ophthalmologist or other ones, you want to have your staff reach out and get the patient notes from those other specialists and, and cast a broad net so you can get a complete picture of what's going on with your patient. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that data, up to 40% of it comes in via fax and it's not really searchable. So someone uh, like a medical assistant or a nurse has to go through those things and, and figure out what to pull for the uh, visit and plan for the visit. And, and generally in primary care, they usually have a sort of a preamble session in the, in the morning for the day for all the patients and the plan of attack where they discuss those all those diagnoses and conditions. If that, that's best practice is what I'm saying. Right. So if you had to give someone, Jeff, a couple of uh, ideas on what are the first steps to do to approach and to improving, where would you go? And then I'd love to hear Lauren's feedback on that as well. Well, again, I, I would really try to get the uh, lab data and the other referral data. If you're a primary care doctor and you should be tracking the referrals, hopefully, uh, you want to make sure you get the closed loop on the referral, which is actually one of the MIP scores as far as closing the referral loops too. Uh, so that would be where I would start because that gives you a treasure trove of additional data from the other specialists that, you know, the primary care doctor is usually the quarterback and that they need to know that information. Lauren, did you have any feedback on that one? So it's a lot of work, right? I mean, I'm listening Very to Jeff. And thinking, I'm thinking that, you know, that's that's a lot of work to, to not only be doing my doctoring, but also to to make sure that after I've referred a patient that that data comes back and that it gets documented. Um, I'm wondering if there isn't like a walk before you run scenario, Jeff, like are there, is there a way to analyze an individual physicians or groups data and think about like, what are the top 10, you know, start with, you know, here's five codes that we haven't been coding that we could be coding or, have you ever done anything like that just to, to get people started? Well, what I generally like to say is that it's not a top five or top 10. You got really got to go in and sort of look at the whole patient. The first thing I really try to make sure gets done is all the lab data uh, get pulled in uh, to the chart. There's a lot of lab data that doesn't get uh, appropriately entered or looked at. Um, when the patients are coming in. And that's the first treasure trove of really good clinical information that I always try to make sure is, you know, fully populated into the chart so the provider is aware of that. That's true. I go to my doctor and I take my labs in with me. Yeah. That's that's a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you know, you'd be amazed at, you know, even with the big lab companies that a lot of the labs and the reports are, are not timely. They don't get sent back or they get faxed in and then they're just left in a pile of paper and not put into the chart. And that's where the sort of the first breakdown is. Because those labs uh, also generate not only some of your quality scores, but they also, are, again, are a treasure trove of clinical information on how to treat the patient. So that's a good point. That, that is a great point. And so, my background of working inside individual practices, one of the biggest complaints of, uh, you know, whether it was the MIPS program or the EHR implementation is, well, who does it? Who in the practice does it? Where, where can I fit this in? I can't fit this in anywhere. So who should do these data reviews? And, and what are the pros and cons of, uh, you know, a front desk person or a doctor? Who, who's doing this work? Should it go to billing? Things like that. If you don't mind sharing, Jeff. So my approach is uh, every physician has a care team. You have front desk, which is you know sort of part of the care team, but their main role is is uh, checking in people, collecting copays and deductibles, uh, determining eligibility, uh, scheduling next visits, etc. So that's like sort of I call it the front end of the team. Uh, the Back end of the team usually has uh, CMAs, uh, nurses, depending on the specialty. And 
I usually try to lean on those people to assist the doctor and, and compile the data and get it uh, organized so that the physician can review that in the morning huddle before he goes in to see the patients for the day. I oftentimes also pair up the physician with a um, and, and, you know, NP or a physician assistant as well on a busy practice to really extend out the uh, throughput and volumes. And they're also very helpful in, in handling some of the more complex cases and evaluating that stuff on the clinical data. All right, so and we've that, seen sounds, that sounds expensive. Is it worth doing all that? Well, it's ex there's an expense to it, but then also there's better throughput. And if you have better documentation of all the conditions, you also get reimbursed more. So it's you got to balance that out. Uh, I can tell you that if you just have you know, a single physician with one MA and one person on the front desk, I can guarantee you with 100% certainty they're undercoding and they're not collecting all the information or the data. It, it's it's a real become a real complex team effort to get all this stuff and do it right. So if they had to hire somebody to do this, is there an ROI there? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I did, we did a study a number of years back at Kaiser um, in sort of parsing down the teams because our physicians were salaried and we had you know worry about productivity as well as documentation. So for every um, Mid mid level that we hired, we had a, a nine to one payoff on on them once they were fully integrated into the primary care practice. As far as additional productivity and clinical teamwork, the uh, ROI for a sort of a really good certified uh, medical assistant that's properly integrated and trained into the team, uh, practicing up to the full scope of their license, uh, is about a four to one payoff. Wow. So you got you got a lot of training and integration to do, and at the end of the day, it all falls back on the physician leader and their uh, sort of ability to manage the team with the help of the administrator. And and you know that sometimes that breaks down. Sure. We ask our physicians to do a lot these days. Yes, we do, and they're they're really overburdened and they're getting burned out. Yeah. Right. So you know we. we it really hits on working from both sides because a lot is asked of doctors on the on the quality side when it comes to MIPS and, and documenting MIPS. And, you know, the big part of MIPS lately has been avoiding the penalty. But with the HCC scoring, it seems that the big thing is is let's get the correct revenue and get more revenue from doing this. So it has the same different outcome, but the same asks. Uh, for yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, the key takeaway on HCCs is, is in, the doctors don't really need to understand HCCs at a granular level, like you know some of us uh, financial people, but they really do need to understand the uh, good documentation, have good templates within the EHRs, and very accurately clinically di uh, diagnose and document all conditions that affect the patient. Or, or their treatment. And that's at the end of the day, the best strategy. Um, and that usually falls apart when they do copy and paste on their patients. <laughs> of course, of course. So what what kind of training can be done? Um, what, uh, what should be done in today if you were to implement this into your organization? So one of the, you start with some of the basics. So with 40% of the population is, you know, either pre-diabetic or diabetic these days, right? And you go in and you do a chart review and you look at all the diabetic patients that had the appropriate diagnosis code. And you'll probably find just starting with that and doing some training on that, that there's a, you peel the kimono back on the diabetic patients and they almost all of them have other conditions that are usually not documented adequately or not documented at all in the chart. And that basically messes up the uh, HCC and RAF scores as well as the uh, overall documentation. So I start with a you know chronic disease like diabetes and then I'll you know go into some of the follow on issues with diabetes as one of the things. And you sort of use that as a, a training um, sort of 
and basically a template. And then you can go into the uh, people that have asthma and chronic obstructive disease, people that are morbidly obese and what you do with them. And you just have sort of training sessions on those and huddles that you know show that you know you got to look for these different things. I mean, pretty much anyone that's uh, diabetic usually has one or two other comorbid conditions with it. It's almost guaranteed. And 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 you you you'd be surprised. You go into a lot of the charts, and they're just one diagnosis is simple di uh, diabetes, and they're not even you know checking the eyes. So they're kidneys, their neuropathy. There's so many other comorbid conditions associated with it. Their hypertension with it, their cholesterol. I mean, it, a lot of that stuff just doesn't get captured adequately or it's in the notes in the back part of the EHR and it's not getting captured by the coders either because it's just a little handwritten notation. So that's why I recommend using good templates. So Jeff, you talked a little bit about labs, but what about um, the other side of the house in terms of um, uh, medications. I've often heard people talk about looking through the medication lists to try to discern some of the ICD coding that hasn't been done. Have you have you yes. worked in that arena as yes. well? The second big treasure trove uh, beyond the labs is the uh, pharmacy data uh, and getting that uh, fed into the EHR. And it, it's a real challenge because uh, you know, some of the patients, or we call them frequent flyers, they go to multiple doctors to try to get different prescriptions, and one doctor won't know what the other one's prescribed. Or the favorite story I always love is, you know, the little old lady comes in with a huge shopping bag full of all these medicines, and, you know, usually the doctor or the nurse practitioner freak out because some were prescribed by them, some were prescribed by the hospitals when they had a hospitalization, some were prescribed by the, some other specialist, and, and some of them are actually contradictory and, and whatnot. And you, you get these patients that are confused and they, they don't even realize that they're taking perhaps the wrong medicines. But so yeah, that's another huge uh, sort of data area that gives you a ton of information on the diagnoses and codes or validation of them anyways. And then you well, also have a compliance say. issue. You have a compliance issue too, because some patients are not really compliant with taking their medicine, you know, either yeah. because they it cost issue or they just don't don't want to take them, you know. So that's a whole nother webinar. We'll talk about that. We're kind of trying to focus on HCC score, right? <laughs> well, that feeds into it though. The, all the pharmacy data does feed into it, so. Right, uh, that's great. And yeah, we have, there's definitely a bunch of tangents that we could fall down uh, when talking about this, but we do want to keep this to an hour. Uh, right. And actually that kind of leads to a question that someone asked uh, on here. And, and you did answer a, a bit of it, but, they kind of want to dip their toe in, Jeff. They want to they want to take a look at how can they make the biggest bang for their buck without making that big of an impact of what they're doing. Is there a top five? Is there something that you can look at that um, that can make the biggest impact? I mean, top five as far as codes like, or top five? Yeah, like a diagnosis diagnosis or comorbidities that they should be looking at. I you know <laughs> I I already sort of mentioned it. You know, I'd start with looking at all the patients that are diabetic or pre-diabetic and start right. diving into them. Yeah, even if they're pre-diabetic, they probably have at least one or two other uh, diagnosis codes that are pro probably not being adequately documented. I mean, that's usually the first place I go to look, so. Gotcha, yeah, and I know we kind of covered that a little bit before, but with the question coming in from uh, someone, I thought we would reiterate that point on there. Well, I mean, um, you know, and you cross over on that. So you have people that are morbidly obese. Um, almost every one of them has three or four other comorbid conditions with the obesity. I mean, you know, it just almost right. always bounces out when there's, you know, above that weight you know, sort of ratio. Oh, I understand that. Um, so, Jeff, what sort of reporting should a practice organization track to ensure the process is uh, generating a benefit? What are the KPIs on on bringing in uh, HCC coding as a impactful product? Well, again, it's you know 
it's the blocking and tackling that you have to do with the documentation. Everything starts with the documentation and make and going back and doing, I used to like to do 10% chart audits random on my providers and look at, just take a random sample and then start diving into it to see if the stuff was documented right with the, you know, usually it's a multidisciplinary team with a, a coder and a, a nurse on it or something like that. And you go into the dive and review it and you look at the uh, those charts and then you give the feedback to the providers. That's where I start. Terrific. And, you know, then another question on, on to that is, you know, we talked about KPIs, but um, do you have to wait to find out the results? What do, what are the results of the work that you're doing and how long do you have to wait normally to receive uh, information on those scores? Well, you submit the updates and the additional diagnosis codes from the provider side. It gets coded uh, and sent in to, you know, to the payer. On the Medicare Advantage side, if you get the information in by June 1st, you'll generally get the additional increased payment uh, usually by December or January or six months, but it can take up to 12 to 18 months for uh, CMS to turn that around. Uh, depending on the Medicare plan and the region. Uh, but you can pretty well accurately track what the before and after is, and you, you can calculate what the expected monetary gain is going to be fairly quickly with uh, some good Excel sheets and pivot tables. And what about the private payers? Are they more timely or the same sort of turnaround to see any impact from your work? Well, the BUCA, you know what BUCA means, right? Uh, they're They're pretty much following about the same timelines as, as CMS right now. It's, it's uh, when I talk to a lot of my doctor friends, they are all complaining about all the payments have really sort of uh, seem to be getting slower and slower as far as getting the you know, funds in. And, you know, that's just sort of the common refrain I hear from most of my doctor friends. So one of the things that CMS has done this year with um, the cost component of MIPS is instead of making it a yearly HCC calculation or risk calculation based on HCC scores, is they are looking at it on a monthly basis. So every right. month they will update it based on, it's a rolling 12 months. So right. you can see the impact faster, which I think was a great idea. Um, it is. And it makes our job going, harder. Yeah, they're also going to, you know, looking at using two years of, of data on the, uh, encounter data versus one year too, because they're finding a lot of error rates with, you know, people, you know, they had certain, you know, diagnosis diseases in one year and then it gets dropped the next year because the provider didn't capture it or code for it. And they're trying to get, sort of get that pulled together as well. There is a substantial variation. And isn't that also being impacted? I've read some studies about COVID how patients aren't coming in, so you're not getting them rescored in your patient population. Yeah, they're, they're not, but uh, you can sort of try to capture some of that if the practice has the telemedicine capabilities and can call the patients and do it that way and you know document it that way. Uh, they're, you know, most of the large insurance payers are, are allowing that to happen because you know a lot of people are afraid to go to the doctor's office unless they're really sick now. Yep. So there's been a number of questions that have come in from uh, the audience as well as one that uh, we had discussed earlier, but uh, they all seem to be around coding. And um, the question I had was, how do you keep from reviewing the same patient data charts repeatedly in the same year? But then on the same side, we did have um, someone in the audience ask, how often does a physician need to code for chronic conditions? And are they expected to code at every visit? So I think those two kind of go together, but I wanted to share those questions with you, Jeff, to see what you were thinking. Well, when, whenever a patient comes in for a visit and they have the chronic conditions, you, you really are technically supposed to code for them uh, every time. Now, a lot of providers have figured out with their templates, they copy and paste some of that information in, but there also can be a new conditions that they need to look for as well that are related to that. Um, the, the other thing is, again, 
getting the information in a timely basis before the patient visits so they can have a complete picture of what's going on with them is, is all, always very helpful. But it's not but always. But isn't the rule that it, that it is a calendar year for non -MIPS? Yes, it's a calendar year. Every year you have to resubmit all the chronic conditions. It's an annual thing, sort of like the annual wellness visit that you know they're supposed to have too. <laughs> and in fact, the annual wellness visits uh, on that side of it, uh, if you know the provider or the vendor that's doing those and documents that stuff, that has also you know a big contributor to uh, capturing HCC codes because they they plan out that whole visit. And there's some really good vendors out there that do a pretty good job of that. So an, a follow-up question to that from one of our uh, audience members too is that, in, and I've seen this question asked a number of times outside of this webinar, but what about those providers that are specialists um, and they don't treat things such as diabetes or high blood pressure, let's say a dermatologist or something like that, what, what are they supposed to do? Can they still code for those complexities even if they're not treating the patient for those, those uh, comorbidities? They're supposed to code for all documented conditions uh, that will affect the treatment of the patient or the uh, you know condition of the patient. So that's the rule. All right, great. So what sort of results have you seen, Jeff, from people that have really taken into uh, their practice to, to understand and to correctly uh, submit their claims with HCC scoring in mind? So HCC scoring is cumulative across all the providers that are treating that patient for that year. You know, so it's a cumulative thing. So the more, if you can get some of the documentation from other providers that, and copy and paste it, it, it makes it easier just to, to sort of say that. But the on the Medicare Advantage plan side, if they, you know, attributed providers, the providers and the ACOs and that do their job right, and you capture all the HCC codes, you can see anywhere from a 20 to 40% improvement in reimbursement to the plan. Uh, year over year by doing it right and we actually have a client that we just did a study on that's uh, using uh, some of our technology and methods uh, and they uh, for the one year got a 40 percent increase in their risk adjustment scores and then reimbursements that could sure have a major major impact on uh, revenue and uh, the future of your business for sure yeah. Yeah, it was, it was worth millions of dollars to them. Uh, and so, and they're continuing to work and look for ways to improve on that as well. Got you. Uh, here's a question from um, one of our audience members. Is there, is it true that a PCP can get an, the HCC RAF score uplift uh, even if they use the diagnosis as being billed by another specialist? I think that basically was answered already, but really th that question has come in a number of times. So, so the, again, getting the ACC score is it's all about diagnosis and documentation. If someone else bills for it, that's fine. You, you're not double billing for it, but you're putting it into the chart for the PCP. Again, keep in mind, the two main areas, the HCC, besides the MIPS uh, stuff that Lauren covered, is it's on a health plan side. So it's the, basically the budget and the financial and risk of that patient holistically. So the PCP definitely wants to get all that information, even if it's coming in from information from a specialist on a chronic condition. And, and, and vice put, versa. And, and vice versa. versa. Yes. Um, because what happens is for a lot of these specialists, you know, if they are getting, uh, you know, I know the MIPS world, right? So if, if they're a hospitalist um, and they may only be seeing that patient in that circumstance, but if they have a history of that patient where they can show that those diagnoses are still, are, are valid for that patient, they should make sure that gets documented, correct? Correct. And it would, it's really helpful to the hospitalist to have all that information, for definitely higher better quality care. Same thing with emergency room doctors, urgent care, or new patients walking into a practice. You really want to try to get the most comprehensive information you can get on that patient before treating them. 
versus you know sort of doing a pin the tail on the donkey. Great. So we have about 10, 10 more minutes, you guys. I really appreciate this. This has been a great conversation. And there definitely uh, are a lot of questions coming in. And I'm sure we're not going to get a chance to get to all of them. Uh, let you know that we will get you those answers to your questions after the webinar is over, as well as you'll have my contact information. I'll send you a copy of the webinar. Um, by the end of today, you'll have my information to get me any questions that you may have. If I need to reach out to Jeff or put you in touch with Jeff, I will. Uh, but uh, Jeff, a couple more questions. So we've discussed telehealth and COVID a number of times through most of this, uh, but what is the impact um, to all of what HCC has for COVID and for telehealth combined? Well, right now you can use telehealth to uh, capture and get additional, obviously, diagnostic and uh, documentation and information on the patient. And you know, right now that's one of the more efficient ways to try to do that uh, versus you know having them come into the practice or whatever. Uh, so that and that's being used and deployed, uh, and I think it's going to continue to be a very important tool. Because uh, I think a lot of this stuff is going to really change the whole operational uh, milieu uh, with how all this stuff is done with the COVID virus and, and accessing patients at home or telemedicine. I think it's going to really accelerate it. All right. And and the last question, and I think uh, this may open up an opportunity for a whole nother webinar uh, based upon this, but. Um, what is the future of HCC and coding? I had someone ask me, what's the future of, outpa of HCC within the outpatient realm? So can you go over a little bit about, um, and explain in English, uh, because we know there is a lot of documentation <laughs> and a lot of words uh, when it comes to what the future is going to look like, uh, and so all of us can, can grab that. So right now we're in the middle of a transition uh, started in 2017 uh, very slowly uh, and it's supposed to be fully converted by 2022. Uh, CMS is basically phasing out the RAP system which is the risk adjustment process system that they've used for years um, and that is uh, right now this year it's a 50-50 split with that and the new uh, EDS system, which is the encounter data system that uh, they come out with the updated models every year. Uh, so this year it's 50-50, you know, feeding the data in from both of those systems. Next year it's going to be 75 EDS and 25% wraps. And then by 2022 it'll be totally the encounter data system conversion. I've, I've seen some modeling there's going to be more HCC codes, and the more you can document and do those, it's, that's actually a positive. There's like five new categories that were added this year, and I think they're going to be adding some more with you know the drug dependencies and other stuff like that, and continue to refine it. Uh, so I think it's a, in that regard, it's a positive step, and the more you get you know the HCC scores, the better you're going to do. Uh, the other side of it, though, is that there with everything like this, there's gonna be a financial impact. And depending on you know, how the plan, Medicare Advantage plans are managed and run, they could see uh, a 10 to 20% decrease in reimbursement for those patients once the full conversion is over. Um, and I've seen some financial projections on that from a couple of the plans that you know, they're worried about that and they're trying to figure out sort of, you know, but again, we won't know the final adjustments on that till the you know 2022 you know model comes out and is fully implemented. And they release those things every year, as you know, with the public announcements and comment periods and then the whatnot. But it's it's uh, we're definitely in the midst of a major change in methodology. So along those lines, what should providers be thinking about? I mean, how do you how do you keep up with that? How do you keep up with that from a practice? Just um, good coding, or are there other things that, that? Well, it's good documentation. And then you have to have good coders that really understand the practice. And, and I, I would tell you, 
a, a good coder is worth their weight in gold. Um, and you, you know, you have, yeah, I mean, seriously, uh, you really need to have good ones and, you know, you need to invest in that. That's where some practices will, you know, sort of bring in people that don't have a lot of that experience or they don't have the experience in this, that one specialty. And, you know, if you're, you're going to do that, you have to send them out to get all the training and, and continually updated education because the stuff changes every year, year over year. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you very much, Jeff and Lauren. I appreciate everybody's time today. We have a couple more minutes, but I'll give those five minutes back to everybody. Uh, we appreciate you coming on to our webinars. Please keep an eye out for our September, September webinar series coming up. I'm sure Jeff and HCC Scoring will be part of it. Uh, but moving forward, we'd love to hear from you and what you want to learn about during these webinars. Uh, we are very happy to share our knowledge and look forward to you linking up with us uh, as we move forward. So thank you, Jeff and Lauren. Appreciate it, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.